Welcome to Lawton Online with your host, Andrew Lawton. He's locked, loaded, and ready to fire. Lawton Online starts right now. Hello and welcome to you, Canada. This is Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. My name is Andrew Lawton. It is a pleasure to have you joining me this afternoon or this evening, whenever it is that you are tuning in. And also, I should say Merry Christmas or Merry Belated Christmas, depending on when you're listening in. I know that podcasts afford you a level of convenience. You don't have to listen on any particular day. So if you're listening to this before Christmas, I hope you have a great one. If you're listening after, I hope you had a great one. It's not going to be a Christmas-themed show, but I'm going to warn you because at recording time, it's just a couple of days before Christmas. So I'm going to be talking about it a lot. And I'm going to be referencing Christmas. I'm assuming. I I don't know for sure, but I'm going to be assuming that's what I'll do because I do love this time of year. But regardless, lots of topics that aren't Christmas related, all politics and culture and lifestyle and that sort of stuff. But it is still a pleasure to have you tuned in for this journey here. Uh, We're going to be chatting later on in the show about religious freedom, which I think has been one of the big discussions that we've had in Canada in 2015. I think it's something that's dominated, and also in the U.S. as well. I mean, in the U.S., 2015 was the year of the gay wedding cakes at Christian bakeries and that non-controversy that then became one when censorship started creeping in. But we're also going to be talking later on about some of the other issues, some of the other factors that have really played into that discussion more domestically like Young Dundas Square in Toronto, like Trinity Western University in its battle to have uh, lawyers that are able to practice across Canada. That's all coming up later on, but I wanted to do somewhat of a year in review thing. As I, I had to remind myself, there still is another show left in the year here, but we have six weeks now of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau under our belts. Now, the country hasn't crumbled in that time. But there still is something to be said about the fact that he's not exactly off to a stellar start. Lisa Raitt, formerly the transport minister, formerly the labor minister, wrote a piece in the National Post talking about the, and I use her word, crumbling of Justin Trudeau's promises in just a month and a half. And it's an observation I've made as well. Even though I have to see that he did come out of the gate running and he did get down to action very quickly, it's the things that he's not taken action on that I think speak volumes about his credibility and, frankly, his character. So to talk a little bit about this piece, very pleased to welcome a former minister and the Honorable Lisa Raitt, opposition critic for finance. Uh, Lisa, great to talk to you. Thanks for your time today. My pleasure. So you had a piece that I've seen in the National Post uh, on a number of different uh, people's Facebook and Twitter profiles. Everyone's sharing it. So you're obviously striking a nerve here. We're six weeks into Justin Trudeau's premiership, and already you're saying that the promises are crumbling. Yeah, and not just me. I mean, even uh, Terry Molesky at CBC had a similar piece on the weekend, just taking an accounting of what was promised, what the Canadian voter was promised they were going to get from the Liberals and what's actually happened in the six weeks since the election. Yeah, and this is a really interesting one because one of the first big ones I saw anyway from my perspective was the refugee issue. And this was not one directly uh, tied to the finance portfolio, but it was uh, something where uh, Justin Trudeau had said, you know what, we're going to bring in 25000 by the end of the year. And, and everyone said, well, I, I don't know if you can do it. He said, yes, we can. And then what do you know? He's in there for a couple of weeks and OK, may, maybe 10000 is a more reasonable number. And that was just the tip of the iceberg we're seeing now as far as things that he he once pledged that now don't seem to be working out. And, and what happened in the election is, I mean, as the Conservative Party, we were government for a long time, no question about it, but we also knew the limits of what our public system could do. We know how much pressure you can put on the officials in the departments, and we know how much um, you can get them to accomplish, given that some of these issues take on so many different aspects, like you're dealing with, for example, the United Nations, you're dealing with other countries, you're dealing with all kinds of different issues. So when we put out our our idea of what we thought was possible and probable, 
Uh, we're very pragmatic about it, and we gave the number which we thought we could do. And it, unfortunately, the Liberals took a flyer, for lack of a better word, and said it was going to be 25000 and it's not. Um, but, you know, we're supportive of the, um, of course, everybody's supportive of bringing people to Canada for a fresh start. I think it's the right thing to do. Um, and we'll make sure that everybody's process, processed appropriately and uh, everyone is safe when they come here um, for their own safety and, and as well making sure that all security measures have been taken into consideration. Uh, more directly aligned with uh, your portfolio, which is finance, one thing that's been very difficult for me to try to get to the bottom of is whether or not we're looking at uh, deficits of what number and for how long and, and how many budgets, because there seems to have been a, a fair bit of double speak on when the balance budget will come or even if it will come at this point, especially when we look at what uh, the Parliamentary Budget Office is saying, and, and you pointed this out in your column as well. Well, we started the um, we started with this Liberal government indicating as their campaign promise that they were going to run moderate deficits of $10 billion, no more. And the purpose was to get the to get the economy growing at a faster rate than what we were currently growing. And Canadians decided that that was the route they wanted to go with. And we have a liberal majority government. And no sooner had they been in for a while, I, I couldn't pin down the finance minister to tell us whether or not those numbers were still accurate. In fact, they don't even talk about what the, the size or the ceiling is of their deficit that they plan on running, what they talk about is some kind of debt ratio going forward. Well, you know, Canadians think about things in real numbers, and it's important for us to understand, well, how far is the country going to go into the hole before we start coming out again, and and how are you going to get us out of the hole once you get us in there? Because the promise that the Prime Minister is sticking to, and he says it's cast in stone, and I will take their word at this, is the fact that we will have a balanced budget when they go to an election in 2019. And and that's, um, that's a very tall promise, given the amount of spending that I'm seeing their ministers go out and unilaterally start um, announcing. Well, especially when ministers are now, as I understand it, not even allowed to mention the initial promise of keeping those deficits to that so-called modest uh, cap of $10 billion. That's right. That's what we understand, that the ministers have been told no longer shall we talk about what the debt ceiling is going to be in terms of what we're, what kind of deficit we're going to be going to, but rather to peg it to that ratio. That ratio, you can do the math on it. It is not a difficult concept, and it's about 25 to $30 billion a year in deficits that they can run. But those are real numbers, and it doesn't talk about coming back out of deficits. You know, you dig a hole of $120 billion dollars, and you don't know your way out, it's, it's pretty tough. You have to be able to come back out of it. So when we look at uh, the the finances, one of the things that happened right out of the gate, uh, the government said that the books that uh, your government left them with weren't as good as uh, it, it was said that they were. Is that something that you take issue with, that assertion? Well, I do. I mean, on the day that the um, Minister Mon- Morneau came out uh, and indicated that uh, well, things were a bit more problematic than they had anticipated. The same day, the Finance Department, which are the officials, put out the real numbers for the end of September. And those real numbers still show that there was a surplus. And the Parliamentary Budget Officer said, we're still anticipating a surplus for the end of this year. If you continue along the path that the Conservatives had us on, and that was our path. Now, there's been a lot of spending that the Liberals have added since they took power on October 19, and that'll factor into what kind of a deficit. But you can't hide from the numbers, and we will make sure that we take account of and understand very clearly who is spending the money to go into deficit at what point in time. So you you can you can make your assertions early on and try to set the table for yourself of lower expectations on balancing budgets, because saying that we left them some kind of hole in the ground, we did not. And... Um, We'll see what happens when the public accounts are published next year, and I'm pretty confident that it'll show that our path was keeping us into uh, into a balanced budget, and the spending that they're doing right now is going to push them over into a deficit this year. Are you given any sources of optimism that uh, there might be a, a new sort of return to fiscal management uh, in the, the next session of Parliament? Because, I, I mean, we're talking about, as you mentioned, real numbers here, and we're dealing with economic uncertainty here. So I'd argue that the stakes are pretty darn high, it seems. I have lots of optimism. I mean, I'm not uh, I'm not a negative person by nature. I'm I am concerned that they do seem 
to want to spend a lot, and they're not very concerned about ensuring that they, they balance on the bottom line. Um, great example of that is this liberal tax plan that they brought in saying, well, we're going to give the middle class a tax break, people like that. Uh, and by the way, don't worry, it's going to be revenue neutral because we'll just make sure that other pay other people pay a little bit more. Well, guess what? It doesn't quite work out. And you're already starting at a $1.2 billion hole in the ground on that measure alone. I worry. You know what I worry about, Andrew? I worry about um, the ministers that are out there. I mean, I was a minister in three different portfolios. And I know that we were very, very careful to ensure that before you started announcing new programming or new money or promising new projects, there's a very rigorous project you go process rather that you go through in Ottawa to ensure that the money is there. It's in the fiscal um, uh, framework that you can spend it because you can't pull it out of nowhere. You can't make promises without having some kind of backup. And I just worry that ministers are out there making lots of promises on certain things that have not gone through the appropriate channels yet, and that stuff will will get bogged down. So I don't think we've seen the last of broken promises. Well, and, and it goes back to that whole uh, over caution, or I guess over uh, over promising that the budget will balance itself that became uh, so synonymous with I think the Liberal government's uh, economic platform to a lot of Canadians because people know that you do have to make tough decisions, and whether uh, the previous government and the previous Prime Minister made all the right decisions uh, is I, I think uh, not as important right now as what's happening in the present and what'll be happening in the future, and. I guess the big question comes down to then what as a critic in a majority government are you really able to do to impact the type of change that you think is needed? Well, we'll continue to hold the minister's feet to the fire and ensuring that he understands that 60% of Canadians did not vote for the Liberal plan. Either they voted for us, they voted for the Greens, or they voted for the Bloc or the NDP. And they don't necessarily speak for everybody in the country. Um, He does have a mandate, but he's going to have to be careful with the mandate in terms of ensuring that it's for the greater good of Canadians. One of the items that they did have in their their platform that they have implemented is the decrease in the uh, the amount of savings that Canadians can put into tax-free savings account. I'm very disappointed in that one because I think that's going to have a huge impact on people's ability to save for their own retirement. And instead, they're going to go down the road of saying, well, working people should pay more of their take-home pay for an expanded Canada pension plan. And and I think it's, um, it is a different approach in terms of what kind of tools you're leaving Canadians to save for their retirements. And I, I just worry about people's take-home pay going down drastically, and that'll cause people to panic. Well, and on the note of, of the CPP expansion, I mean, this is uh, something that you and I are impacted by as Ontario residents right now, because we already know uh, what uh, Premier Wynne is looking to do with the provincial pension plan. So there is a, a big, I think, uh, negative or black cloud, if you will, of uncertainty over the middle class in Ontario on retirement savings and what's going to happen. We're certainly going to feel the pinch. Uh, We're not seeing the wages increase a lot because you're going to see companies having to make choices as to what they're going to do. Uh, Are we going to hire another person when we have to increase the amount of Canada Pension Plan um, uh, money that we give to the government for our current workforce? And, you know, people care about jobs still, I think, at, at the end of the day and creating jobs because... Whether you care about your own job uh, or you're worried about whether or not your kids are going to have a job or your grandkids are going to have a job, that's really important. And we need to make sure that business, the private sector, is ready to create jobs. And um, taxing them uh, is not the way to get them to be motivated to create jobs for anybody. And any of these expanded programs or higher taxes or more red tape or different programs or deficits or higher power prices, all those things are really negative for private companies here in Ontario. Well, I look forward to seeing uh, what you're able to do to hopefully curb some of uh, what we've been promised and what we're seeing so far. Uh, Lisa Raitt joining me on the line, opposition critic for the finance portfolio and also MP for Milton. Lisa, uh, great to talk to you as always. Uh, Thank you very much and Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas, Andrew, and I invite your listeners to write us anytime here in Milton if they have concerns about the financial aspects of Canada, and we'd be happy to pass them on to the Minister of Finance. Lisa, thanks again. Thanks again. Bye-bye. What do you think? Do you agree with her? Do you think that the opposition is doing a good enough job at holding the Prime Minister's government to account so far? 
Andrew at andrewlawton.ca is my email address. We'll be right back in just a couple of moments with more Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. He's unapologetic, unwavering, and unafraid to take on the left sacred cows. He's Andrew Lawton, and you're listening to Lawton Online on the Rebel.media. Welcome back to Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. I promised you some Christmas references. This will be, I assure you, one of the most Christmassy segments I do this show. Uh, not one of the. It will be the most Christmassy segment I do this show. And it's one you could listen to after Christmas and still enjoy. So don't touch that proverbial dial just yet. Uh, Leah McLaren in the Globe and Mail wrote a really interesting column, and I don't mean that in a flattering sense, last week about Christmas presents. That's the, the broad theme in which her piece falls. Now, Leah McLaren writes for McLean. She also writes uh, for the Globe and Mail. She's Canadian, but she lives in London, England. And she wrote about what apparently is every mother's worst nightmare here. And I think that's a bit of a hyperbole, but I'm going to read a section of her piece before I get into too much detail here. She says, quote, when my seven-year-old stepson, Freddie presented me with his list for Santa Claus this year, I was relieved. Lately, I've noticed a premature adolescent jadedness creeping into his mannerisms, and I'd be worried he might take it upon himself to disillusion his younger brother, James, who at three and a half is still a fervent believer. What a sweet surprise, I thought, unfolding the list. It was written in festive red cursive and read as follows. Number one, AK-47. Number two, a catapult. Number three, Swiss Army knife. Number four. Nerf Zombie Strike Flip Fury. Number five, Nerf Elite Rhino Strike Blaster. Number six, more bullets. Number seven, a lifetime supply of mint chocolate chip ice cream. Now, first off, I'm completely on his side on all of those, especially the mint chocolate chip ice cream. But this is what Leah McLaren writes completely unironically. The list wasn't Freddy's way of having me on. It was a unilateral declaration of war. The headline of the piece, quote, despite my best efforts, my stepson wants guns for Christmas, unquote. She talks about the fact that British men have to deal with less in the way of street violence that has to do with firearms because of Britain's firearms laws. She talks about the fact that police in the UK aren't armed. She says toy guns are just part of the regular landscape of childhood right up there with gendered Lego and cowboy and Indian-themed Halloween costumes. She talks about the fact that she and other parents regard gun toys as candy cigarettes and padded bikini tops for girls. Symbols of years past. She talks somewhat tongue-in-cheek about her domestic disarmament policy. But then she said that she got him on the wrong track, her steps on the wrong track after a last birthday where she gave military battleships, super soaker pistols, light up laser guns. And now she wants to disarm. She wants to get rid of the toy guns. She wants to get rid of the toy firearms of all kinds. She wants to get rid of the toy battleships. Apparently she doesn't want her son to want anymore. She says she doesn't like that her boys talk about killing. She says, quote, the more my husband and I earnestly try to impress upon them the real life horrors of terrorism, mass shootings and the carnage of ongoing missile attacks in Syria, the more their murderous little eyes widen and their hunger for make believe violence grows. Their bloodthirstiness seems to flourish in inverse proportion to the number of anatomically correct dolls, toy kitchens, and gender-neutral, non-conflict-based games I press upon them. Just last week, my three-year-old told me that when he grows up, he wants to be a flying soldier with loads of guns and a cricket bat for killing zombies who try to eat my brain, unquote. This is indicative that she's raised her children right, I think. 
if you have young boys that are growing up and aren't interested in violence, aren't interested in guns, aren't interested in weaponry, then you're doing something wrong. This is not something that parents should fear. This is that politically correct, knee-jerk, weak pansy reactionism creeping in. And I'm not talking about Leah. I'm talking about a lot of Western liberal parents in general right now. The fact of the matter is we are surrounded and immersed in violence, both fictitious and real life. You turn on the news, you see violence. You turn on any movie, you see violence. And people have talked about needing to whitewash all of film and whitewash television. And the big one is video games. Eliminate video games where people have said it's not good to reward someone with points for killing someone. Yeah, but you lose points if you kill someone innocent. So it really balances out in the end. And I think that's wrong. Not because I love violence, but in actual fact, I've seen studies that have pointed to a correlation between kids being able to get out their anxiety or stress or frustration, whatever the case may be, in these video games as an outlet, rather than having to take it out in real life. There are also, in the interest of fairness, studies that have shown the opposite, where these things are making violence a lot more attainable or a lot more realistic for people. But then we have the idea that parenting needs to be done by the parents. Parenting needs to be done by the people who have that job title of mom or dad. And they're the ones that need to stress upon their kids' boundaries. But you don't do that by eliminating what is a fun part of childhood. There's a reason that gun toys have been around long before video games. There's a reason that gun toys have been around for a great deal of the history of the actual manufacture of toys. Because they've always been desired. We live in a culture that actually has the existence of firearms. And let's face it, toys have to be, at least in some way, a reflection of the real world. Now, that doesn't mean that every toy has a real-life counterpart to it, but it means that, for the most part, you're having to create a toy, a product, a device, a unit, whatever the case may be, that someone can understand in a real-life context. That's why Cops and Robbers has always been a fun game. That's why grown-ups play with their toys for paintball and Laser Quest. And there's another one now, Airsoft, where you're not shooting paintballs, you're shooting, like, pellets at people. I don't know. I've never done it before, but I've heard it's fun. People enjoy it. That's what matters the most. So when parents start getting their backs up against the wall and start getting scared that their kids want guns, that is not a failing of a parent. Parents have to know the limitations of their child. I stress this point again because people don't seem to realize that every kid is different. There are going to be some kids like me that just never really was were that violent. That was just never a part of my DNA. Sure, that didn't mean that I didn't do a pow, pow, pow or a bang, bang, bang when I was playing, but it was fun. If you deny kids these opportunities, then all that's happening is they're going to then want to get them elsewhere anyway. And someone at the school is going to have a toy gun, and that's when problems start to happen, when you get kids, like, sneaking the gun from home, I guess. So where is the answer lying here? I think, for starters, we need to recognize that it is not supposed to be feared. It's not supposed to be feared. She even sees, Leah McLaren, in her own piece, that there's a chance that the desire, the obsession with weaponry that she cites in her son might have waned if she hadn't confiscated in the past the toy guns that he actually had. And that's a big point because interests naturally fluctuate. Interests naturally naturally fluctuate for all people, especially for kids and teens, where there is this sensory overload of things, toys, games. It's, for me anyway, a, a memory that I had growing up. I mean, we were never spoiled at Christmas, but we were treated very well. And maybe we were spoiled by definition. I mean, we, we grew up not absolutely, uh, I mean, we, we, we grew up not rolling in cash or anything. But you know what? My parents always made Christmas work. And you'd have so many things to play with. You'd have so many toys. You'd have so much you could do. And then naturally, as the year goes on, you sort of lose interest in certain things. That's why you're asking for things for next Christmas, because, well, by that point, your interests have changed. And this is what parents need to realize. 
And by the way, if we break bring this into a totally real world level, I think every jurisdiction that's tried to ban guns has proven that they don't work. They don't eliminate that desire that exists. All they do is make them want it even more. We've got to take a quick break here. So, yes, I will take guns for Christmas is the moral of the story. When we return, more Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. Stay tuned. Listening to Lawton Online with your host Andrew Lawton, exclusively on the Rebel Media. Welcome back, my friends, to Lawton Online here on the Rebel Media. It is a year-end show almost. I guess we'll have one more in 2015, and I'm not a big New Year's person. I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next show. Uh, But it is, I think, important around this time of year to recap some of the things that have happened in the past year, some of the things that have happened, some of which, by the way, are still ongoing. And one thing that really struck me about 2015 is that it seems to have been a year where religious liberty really did play in a great deal to a lot of the stories that were happening in Canada. And the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms was at the forefront of a great many of these battles and still is, from Trinity Western University to the Voices of the Nation's concert in Young Dundas Square to other ones that are still ongoing. But there have been some redemptive moments in this. It's not all about how religious freedoms are gone. It's about how, in many ways, we're reclaiming them. So I wanted to talk with someone who has, as I mentioned, been really in the battlefield on this portfolio and on this file all across the country when these issues have arisen. So it's my pleasure to welcome John Carpe. John, great to have you on the show, sir, the president of the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms. Hey, glad to be with you. It's funny because whenever we talk, usually it's because we're talking about something bad that's happening or someone that's being denied their rights, denied their freedoms. The last few weeks has actually had some good news on the Religious Liberties portfolio. So I wanted to to have the good with the bad here and and talk to you about some of the victories, victories we're seeing. We did have a favorable court ruling uh, earlier this month uh, coming out of the uh, the BC court in the uh, Trinity Western case uh, concerning their proposed law school. Yeah, and this is uh, where I actually wanted to start off with you on here. I want to cover a, a couple of things later on that are all under that banner of, of religious freedoms and, and religious liberties. Uh, but one of the big ones that I think Canada has seen in the last couple of years now has been Trinity Western University. So just to give everyone a bit of a recap, this is the uh, private Christian university that makes students uh, or requests that students, rather, uh, if they want to go there, uh, uh, agree to a covenant that says they won't have uh, sex outside of marriage, and that includes Uh, any sort of homosexual relationships. The battle, though, is not over the covenant, but whether uh, the law societies in Canada are actually going to recognize law school graduates from Trinity Western. So we're seeing this unfold province by province across Canada. I know the Ontario uh, Law Society is still uh, kind of going through the the courts right now, but but what happened in B.C.? Well, B.C. is one of the three uh, court actions because we, we had law societies in in BC, Ontario, and Nova Scotia, uh, say that they're not going to recognize graduates from Trinity Western's law school, and it, it it's relevant that all of these law societies admit publicly, and they admit in the court proceedings that there's nothing wrong with the law program at Trinity Western University. They all admit that it, it meets the academic standards, the professional standards. Their sole beef is with a uh, community covenant that prohibits sex outside of the marriage of one man and one woman. And so, you know, no issue that that these are going to be properly qualified law graduates based on the law school. BC's was a little bit unusual because in early 2014, the um, Law Society of British Columbia, which governs the legal profession, actually ruled in favor of acknowledging uh, the the law degree at Trinity Western University. And they did this after very thorough 
deliberations about uh, all of the arguments, the charter rights, the charter freedoms. And there were a lot of the the benchers, as they're called, who are kind of the directors, the governors, a lot of the benchers said that they personally disagreed with the uh, with Trinity Western's uh, community covenant. That you know they wouldn't go to that school themselves. They don't don't like it, don't care for it. But just as a matter of fundamental freedom in a free society, if uh, if a bunch of Christians or you know, a bunch of Jews, a bunch of Muslims want to form a religious community and set up their own rules, including standards for sexual behavior, they should have the freedom to do that. So the Law Society of BC granted approval in April, and then in, uh, in, in September, there was a referendum of lawyers in BC, and roughly two-thirds of the lawyers voted against Trinity Western University, which is pretty sad when lawyers don't respect charter freedoms. Yeah. And then then the 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 Law Society of BC changed its mind and said, "Okay, we're not going to approve this after all." And now we have a court's uh, decision saying, uh, "No, no, no, you got it right the first time when <laughs> you considered the charter rights." And uh so uh Right now, there, there's a green light for Trinity Western in um, in British Columbia, which is especially important because it is the home province of where Trinity Western University is located. And what's really fascinating to me here has been just this level of, I don't like it, therefore it shouldn't be allowed. And and I, it was quite refreshing to hear what the people in the BC Law Society had said in, in, in the initial stages, which was, yeah, we don't necessarily uh, buy into this, but they don't have any grounds to block other people who want to go to the school from going there. And what I've said on the show in the past is that I don't think the legal profession is this monolithic group where everyone has to think and feel and look and act the same way. There are Christians of different faiths, Christi- or uh, lawyers of different faiths, lawyers of no faith at all, lawyers with different political beliefs. So th- having diversity in the legal profession doesn't really seem to be a bad thing, but actually quite a good thing. Be wary of people who talk about diversity, because in, in my experience, the more people talk about diversity, uh, the, the less in favor of actual diversity they really are. Yeah. Um, when you hear uh, people talk about diversity, often wh- what they're really saying is, everybody has to agree with my uh, progressive postmodern uh, opinions about sexual morality. <laughs> and, you know, we have to, you have to agree with me that, uh, that all forms of sexual behavior are, are perfectly acceptable. And if you don't agree with, with me on that, then you're against diversity. But, you know, really what Trinity Western is introducing is, is real diversity into Canadian law schools, because every other law school in the country buys into the same, uh, you know, socialist economics and feminist and Aboriginal rights and gay rights. And that whole left-wing agenda permeates every law school in Canada. They're all the same, uh, there's no diversity right now amongst Canadian law schools. If Trinity Western gets a law school, it'll be the only one in Canada that's actually different. So they're actually introducing diversity into legal education that is not there currently. And that's probably why it's terrifying the status quo so much. Is the uh, BC decision in your eyes going to be appealed to the Supreme Court? Well, it'll be up to the BC, the, the Law Society of BC will have to uh, choose whether to appeal it to the next level, which is the BC Court of Appeal. My, my prediction is that they would because, you know, people who lose typically do like to appeal. And also, um, we've got the court actions in Ontario and Nova Scotia that are both now before the Ontario Court of Appeal and the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal. So, you know, I, I, I would not be surprised if the uh, BC Law Society also appealed it to the BC Court of Appeal. And then, as you said, Andrew, this is very likely to end up in the uh, Supreme Court of Canada. It just baffles me in a way, and I I know that it will bother me because you can't give a logical answer to what I think is or appears to be anyway a fundamentally illogical problem. But lawyers that are devoting countless uh, amounts of dollars and time and energy into fighting against religious freedom and and freedom of expression, 
there is no sensible explanation for that. And that's why I'm dumbstruck. I'm like, maybe I'm missing something here. But no, I don't think I am. I I think that there is a group of people, as you've mentioned, that is uh, dead set against having this level of what is effectively characterized by your organization as an intervener, religious freedom. Well, I think it's it's people who see their own opinions about sexual morality as being not an opinion, but the absolute truth with a capital T. And then, in their minds, you know, if you if you believe in or you know or, or if you actually practice traditional uh, sexual morality, you know, as a, a practicing Catholic or evangelical Christian or an Orthodox Jew or or a Muslim, and if you actually believe that uh, you know marriage is sacred and holy, and that's the only place uh, where you legitimately can have sexual uh, expression, if you believe that, it from the viewpoint of of some lawyers and particularly some of these law societies. Uh, that's on par with racism to to uh, to, to suggest that uh, that not every type of sexual behavior is acceptable. So they they see their own view. Uh, they see their own opinion about sexuality, which is basically, you know, whatever you want to do, go for it as long as it's consensual. It's great. Uh, they see that opinion as being on par with uh, a belief in racial equality, and so. Trinity Western or anybody else who departs from this and says, well, you know, some in our belief, certain forms of sexual expression are sinful or wrong, unnatural, immoral, whatever. Uh, they actually equate that with racism. And they say, well, look, if you uh, uh, if you think that gay sex is, is uh, unnatural or unhealthy or immoral, uh, then you're the same as a racist, and we have the right to shut you down. Because in the same way that we don't tolerate racism in this country, we're not going to tolerate your opinion on sexual morality. And that's, I think that's how their thinking works. Yeah, I agree with you very much on that. Uh, talking about religious freedom, religious liberty, it is, after all, the holiday season, and uh, this is what it's all about, to talk about constitutional law, right? Uh, <laughs> wanting to, uh, to to talk about one of the other big uh, events that happened, and this was one that didn't get a lot of media coverage, but was still a, a very, very significant turn of events, and that was a group in Toronto which was denied the right to have a Christian concert at Young and Dundas Square. Now, this is a a publicly owned space. The group has had a a concert there in the past. They wanted to get together and talk about Jesus and sing about Jesus and sing about God, have a grand old time. And the public administrator of this said no initially. Uh, Now, John, your organization was very quick to uh, step up and uh, defend uh, Voice of the Nations here. Uh, Talk to me a little bit about what happened here. Well, it was it was in October that uh, um, for the sixth year in a row to have a music festival. It's an all day event, and they um, they have different um, uh, Christian artists, uh, singers, dancers uh, from different uh, cultures and different ethnicities, which is why they call it Voices of the Nations. And um, so they they had had their event there for uh, five years in a row and wanting to do a sixth event in 2016, they applied, and the city official said, "Mm, you're not allowed to come back because you are proselytizing. And one of the representatives said, and this this phone conversation was was recorded, um, so what do you mean proselytizing? And the city official said, well, you're you're singing this song, and it's about uh, praise the Lord, praising Jesus, uh, there's no God like Jehovah, and that's proselytizing. And the representatives said, yeah, but we, you know, we didn't even have anybody preaching. Uh, and uh, the lady said, well, it doesn't matter if it's preaching or singing. You're, you're proselytizing. You're not welcome back. So the Justice Center uh, wrote a letter on behalf of this group to the city of Toronto and uh, pointed out how this is a violation of charter freedom of religion, charter freedom of expression. This is a public square. Uh, gets used all the time by um, uh, Muslims, Hindus, uh, lesbian and gay rights people, um, uh, marijuana legalization advocates. They had and even Christians in the past. Uh, Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's a public square. It's it's there for everybody. Um, Now we had a hearing on. uh, It was it was a hearing before an appeal board that took place on. Thursday, December 10th, 
and it was a generally favorable outcome. The board ordered the city staff to meet with Voices of the Nations and basically to uh, to, to work with the group and let this move ahead. Uh, the only downside was um, it's going to be we have to wait until it looks like we'll have to wait until early February until this is formalized and finalized. Uh, but it, it looks like uh, this is going in the right direction and they can have their event as they have in the past few years. Well, what bothered me about this wasn't just the timeline, obviously, but the fact that it wasn't even like the city realized on its own, you know what, we should probably reconsider here. The fact that it took a, a hearing and an appeal process to, to overturn that seems to be a bit baffling. Well, in the city bureaucrat in question, a lady by the name of Natalie Bellman, she didn't even inform Voices of the Nations, and, and this is before they had had legal counsel, didn't even tell them that there was an appeals process or a right to appeal. Oh, wow. She said, no, this is done. This is finished. And that's simply not true. There is there is an appeal process available, and it's incumbent upon government authorities, including you know uh, city council, city officials, they're supposed to inform people of a right to appeal in a situation like this. And I would say, even if they were proselytizing, who cares? <laughs> I mean, that would be my approach, even if they did have someone preaching and talking about why people should, you know, embrace Christianity. I don't think that would offend me, nor would it offend me if a Muslim group were doing it. I would just say, OK, well, as long as you're not interfering in my rights or liberties in any way, carry on. Well, this is part of the the issue with Voices of the Nations. We have urged uh, the City of Toronto to review its current policy against proselytizing. It, it's a really it's it's a well intentioned policy. I, I think the idea behind it is that uh, we want to avoid uh, harassment, uh, but. You know, you can address that problem by just creating a policy against harassment. Yeah, and absolutely. Saying, for example, uh, that if somebody says, I don't want to talk to you, that you're not allowed to follow behind them and keep on asking them to get into a conversation after they've told you, I'm not interested in speaking with you. So if they want to do an anti-harassment policy, uh, I'm in favor of that. I think just about everybody would be in favor of that. But the problem with banning proselytizing is any time you're expressing any political or religious opinion let's see you're you know you're in favor of gay rights you're in favor of legalizing marijuana or you're uh, you're chanting uh, hara krishna or you're ha- handing out korans which is what muslims are doing every day at young dundas square uh they're handing out korans and other uh islamic literature it doesn't matter what religious or political perspective you speak out you are proselytizing the moment that you uh, state your opinion on something. Yeah, it's a very, I think, unique way of looking at it. So having that anti-proselytization policy really uh, doesn't mean much if they have such a broad uh, definition of it. I wanted to ask uh, a little bit about this other story that uh, is more recently coming to the fray in Winnipeg. Now, here is not a victory yet. It could turn into that at some point, uh, but it call, falls into this uh, question that we've been talking about a lot of equality and uh, your own sort of autonomy as an individual. Uh, what's going on? Well, there's a there's a marriage commissioner by the name of Kevin Kisilowski. He is a biker. Uh, he's also a very strong practicing Christian, and he has um, what he calls a, a ministry or an outreach to bikers. And so he himself is a biker. You know, he's got the uh, the black leather jacket and the rings, and <laughs> it just <laughs> looks and walks and talks like a biker. Except that he's, uh, or not except, but he's he's a Christian biker, and and uh, one of the things that he's done in the past uh, decade or, or so is he's also a marriage commissioner, and in the circles that he travels in, when people want to get married, uh, he will marry them, and a lot of the circles that he travels in, these are not church going people for the most part. But when they want to get married, they don't really have a church to go to. They might not want to get married in a church. And so Kevin Kisilowski, as a marriage commissioner, uh, has been doing this for a decade and marrying people upon request. He doesn't advertise his services. He's not doing it to make money. Anyway, uh, when 
the definition of marriage was changed um, so that it's not just male and female, but uh, two people of the same sex. When that change took place, uh, he was stripped of his marriage license uh, because he said that he's a Bible-believing Christian. He won't do same-sex ceremonies. Um, he doesn't commonly or typically get approached by anybody anyways because he's not advertising for his services. Uh, but he, he said if somebody approached me, I would help them find somebody else. And yet, he well, was Which isn't hard, license. given that any sort of justice of the peace will do it now. Uh, yes. And, you know, on, on in Manitoba, you, you've got roughly a thousand marriage commissioners on the government's website. And with the exception of maybe six or seven people, all thousand marriage commissioners are available to do same sex ceremonies. So like there's there's not an issue there. And yet the government of Manitoba is just relentlessly and aggressively uh adopting this approach that that every single, you know, these six or seven people uh in Manitoba who cannot in good conscience perform a same sex ceremony because they, they that's contrary to their religion. And the government of Manitoba takes the position, well then you can't be a marriage commissioner at all. And so this is in court. All right. Well, we'll definitely have to have you on to keep us posted on that. Sounds like a, a very fascinating case. Glad we're seeing some victories on the horizon for religious freedoms or more broadly for uh, constitutional rights in Canada. Uh, John Carpe, president of the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms, joining me on the line. Uh, John, really great to talk to you, sir. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks for yours, Andrew. Take All right. care. All right. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. When we return in just a couple of moments' time, we will have more of Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. Stay tuned, Canada. We'll be right back. Email your thoughts to Andrew at andrewlawton.ca or tweet Andrew using at Andrew Lawton. Welcome back to Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. This show and the last couple of weeks in general, I think, has had a, an undertone to it of the future of conservatism in Canada. Now, arguably, that's kind of the undertone of every show that I do. And I, I want to stress that when I talk about that, I'm talking about conservatism with a small c. You know, even though you listening might know that already, it stands to reason that a lot of Canadians don't necessarily understand that divide that exists between a political party, a political identity, and an ideological identity, an ideological vision for the country, for the world. I am, as I've joked in the past, kind of a conservatarian. Libertarians accuse me of being too conservative. Conservatives accuse me of being too libertarian. I focus on referring to myself as just me. I'm sort of a, a take it as it comes sort of guy. I'll talk about the issues, talk about my belief. Ultimately, the way I describe my own values are that I believe the government should exist in a libertarian setting. I think people should exist in their own lives as social conservatives. That's it. But the libertarian in me says people get to make that decision for themselves. Now, the reason I give you that preamble is because in Canada, it's very difficult to talk about a future for conservatism that doesn't involve talking about the Conservative Party of Canada. That is the preeminent voice of, in some way, conservatism. And as much as I do and, and we all can criticize when they may stray from that, they're all the best chance we have of seeing conservatism enacted in Canada, certainly at the federal level. So I spoke uh, last week or two weeks ago to conservative leader Ron Ambrose on the program, and I wanted to this show take a little bit of a step back and look at it from more of an outside perspective. We had Lisa Raid on the show at the top to talk about some of the inadequacies of the status quo, but there was a really interesting column in the Globe and Mail uh, this week by Tony Clement, formerly the Treasury Board president, talking about the future of the Conservative Party in Canada. Where does it go from here? And that was a similar theme to what I spoke about with Rana Ambrose last week. So I wanted to take a little bit of a more 
outside looking in perspective here and talk about the future of conservatism with a man who has worked on conservative campaigns. He's worked on campaigns in the U.S. as well. And he's approaching this from a think tank columnist perspective, formerly the vice president of the National Citizens Coalition, known as one of Canada's top five political minds. And he joins me on the line now, uh, the great Jerry Nichols. Jerry, great to have you on the show, sir. Really appreciate your time today. Well, it's awesome to be here, Andrew. We have, uh, obviously, in, in Canada, a, an interesting four years ahead. As, as people that lean to the right, I think we'll be uh, given a number of uh, avenues for which we can pull our hair out and a number mm-hmm. of, of avenues for which uh, there might be alternative visions that we have for the country. But let's face it, Trudeau won a majority government. He won it fair and square. And now the Conservatives go from having a, a 10-year rule to being in opposition now. So... Let's talk first off about what a party should be doing when they lose the way that the Conservatives lost. Because I think that you get two sides. You, on one side, you get the uh, what happened in the Ontario PC party recently. We got to just get rid of everything and everyone and, and start again. And then you have the, okay, we got to fine-tune what we already have. Well, I think the federal Conservatives have to, you know, first of all, keep in mind the positives. Okay, Yeah, they, they lost the election, but they're still in pretty good shape. Uh, They have 100 MPs or so in the House of Commons, so they have a sizable force in Parliament. They still have their structure in place in terms of fundraising. Um, And and, and most importantly, they kept their base. Um, Keeping your base is really important in politics because that's what you have to build on. That's the foundation you use to win elections. So I think those are all the good things. Those are the positive things that conservatives can can keep in mind as they move forward. Uh, But they're still going to have some really significant challenges heading into 2016 and into the new year. Um, You know, basically, I think one of the challenges is they have to answer some some pretty basic questions. Uh, Who are we? Uh, You know, what do we stand for? Uh, What does it mean to be a conservative? Um, They have to define themselves, uh, both to themselves and to the Canadian public, and, uh, and present themselves as an alternative to the Liberals. And the good thing about having four years is they get a lot of time to do that and, and sort of come up with an ideology, come up with ideas, and come up with a platform that will resonate with Canadians. See, one thing that I think we can take out of that that makes it a bit problematic is that a lot of people want to immediately swing the pendulum to the other direction. I mean, let, let's look at the, the fact that as a big tent party and as a product of the merger between a more right-leaning party and between a, a more center-right party, there has been uh, underscoring what happens in the party that this, not a clash, but there is still a, a marked divide between the old so-called red Tories and the blue Tories. And, and I think that whenever... There's a loss. You have Stephen Harper, who's coming at it from the uh, alliance reform side of things. People are are saying from the inside, from the more progressive side of the party, okay, it's time to bring the party uh, to the center a bit, be more progressive. Is that ever the answer in a situation like this? Well, yeah, I think you you, you touched on another another challenge uh, that the Conservative Party is is facing in 2016. And, and, And I would put it this way, that the Conservative Party really isn't a party. It's not really a monolithic group. It's really a coalition of various tribes and factions and clans which often hate each other as much as they hate the Liberals or the NDP. Sometimes more. (laughs) Yeah, perhaps more. I mean, you touched upon it. You have the Red Tories. You have uh, social conservatives. You have populists. You have neocons. You have libertarians. And they often don't get along very well. Now, one of Stephen Harper's uh, genius as a leader, and he had his faults, but I think one of his great skills was he sort of kept this, 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 this group together kept them united under his banner. Now, he, he, he used savage discipline to do that, but he did it. He kept them united and kept them strong, and, and, he, and he kept them as an effective fighting force throughout the time that, that he was prime minister. And this is, this is the challenge the next leader is going to have, whoever he or she is. is he has to be tough, uh, but not mean-spirited, and also able to kind of you know, have a, find the glue to hold the Red Tories and the populists and, and the libertarians all together. And that isn't easy. That's that's really difficult. Yeah, and it's really interesting as well. When we look at the list of people that are touted as contenders for the leadership, you have, I think, one who, who's who been sort of seen by a lot of people as leader-in-waiting, Jason Kenney, who is probably the closest of the uh, contenders to Stephen Harper as there is, both in terms of ideology and, and even geography. I think the two of them are, are from neighboring ridings in Calgary. And then you've got names like Tony Clement that are floating around, Michelle 
Rempel, Lisa Raitt. There are uh, people like Peter McKay that are, are, are being sort of hailed by some as a potential for a comeback, although I'm not sure he would go for that. What's your, your sense of, of the leadership candidates that we think might be interested? Well, they, they all have strengths. They, they all have weaknesses. I mean, there, there's no one that sort of, you know, stands out as the heir apparent. Um, there's no one that you say, aha, this is, this is the person that is, is the obvious front runner. Um, some, you know, uh, some seem stronger, like Jason Kenney, only because, as you said, he's been around for a long time. He has very strong name recognition. He's got a lot of ties in the party. On the other hand, um, his connection to the old regime uh, might be a negative. For Jason Kennedy. Yeah, or, uh, if people go to that pendulum swinging theory of, of running to the opposite direction. Right. I was going to say that the, 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 you know, the, the Peter McKay faction would be the more of the red Tory, the more let's be more progressive faction. And, you know, this is important for the conservatives because they can go in all kinds of different directions. I mean, there's, there's no one way of conservatism. There are, there are all kinds of different brands of conservatism, and you can take different routes. I, I could see the conservative party you know, heading in a couple directions. It might move, as you said, sort of the progressive left-wing side of the Conservative Party. It could uh, sort of embrace a right-wing uh, populism, um, as this case is happening in the United States with a guy like Trump. Uh, or it might be to do something else. My own preference uh, for a Conservative Party moving forward would be to kind of update uh, the Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Mike Harris brand of conservatism, which sort of Sticks to fiscal issues, uh, taxes, government spending, max, uh, sort of talks about minimizing the role of government and maximizing individual freedom. I think that would be, uh, that would allow them to take a message that resonates beyond their base and could also resonate with Canadians who, who might not now be voting conservative. So really take on a more libertarian approach almost? Yeah, I, I'm, I personally am a libertarian, so I have a bias. <laughs> as as that do I, don't worry. Um, so I have a bias, but I, but I think, you know, I think that kind of approach would resonate with people who are tending to be more socially liberal in a lot of their attitudes, but are concerned about taxes, they're concerned about uh, the fiscal situation of the government. Um, I think if you had a, a... Andrew, it's all in the packaging, right? It's all in how you get your message out. You can have the best ideas in the world, but you have to be able to communicate it in a way that resonates with people. I always tell my clients, uh, voters don't care what you think, they care about what they think. And so you have to have a message that says, I'm listening to what you're saying. I understand your concerns. I got some policies. That come, I got some ideas that will meet those concerns. Uh, we're chatting a, a little bit about a column that Tony Clement had, uh, one of the men uh, who's ultimately eyeing potentially the permanent leadership of the Conservative Party. And one of the things that he wrote in his piece in the Globe and Mail is that, quote, there are critical issues facing the Conservative Party as an electoral machine. We must also do a better job of organizing and training in our conservative ranks and adapt far better to the new online world. Better social media presence is just the start of the effort. Community is now defined not only as what exists in our cities and towns, but the virtual communities of the online world, unquote. Jerry, you've done a lot of uh, interaction with clients, uh, candidates, not just in Canada, but also in the U.S. on this. How much of a party's success or a candidate's success is policy versus practice, versus how they get the message out, how they work as that so-called electoral machine? Policy is almost zero importance. <laughs> that, that's that's uh, not, not a, an enlightening thing for someone like me who loves policy. Yeah, you're the one person. Yeah, but unfortunately. Um, most people, Andrew, do not really pay that much attention to politics. There are some people who do. These are the partisans, are the people who follow politics and listen to your show and, and read the columns. Um, but they're a, they're a minority. The, the vast majority of people in this country only, if, if you're lucky, pay half attention to the political news as to what's going on. So if you, if you go out there with kind of a you know, policy-heavy, you know, here's our platform, here's what we want to do, um, you're, you're not really going to m- make a lot of inroads. I always tell people, they'll say, oh, Jerry, here's my 15-point here's my you know, plan. And I always say, well, you know what? You're giving people 15 reasons not to vote for you. <laughs> um, you have to have really sort of simplistic approach. You have to talk about a vision. You have to have sort of an emotional appeal. You have to get your message out to people basically in less than 15 seconds. You know, it has to fit in a bumper sticker. Um, you know, you, a great example, this is Donald Trump in, in, in the United States. Uh, he's a guy that's just all, you know, all sizzle, no steak. And yet he's, you know, he's doing really well in the polls. 
So, I, you know, I, I know this is going to disappoint a lot of policy-oriented people like you, um, but you really have to talk about values. You know, that's what people care about. They care about values, uh, not so much policy. So you have to come up with ideas. You have to come up with a message that says, my values are, are, are in line with your values. I'm, I'm part of what you are, and I want to protect you. That's how you, that's how you win an election. That's how, you, that's how you get a message out to voters. One interesting thing that I, I think we, we've seen in the Conservative Party in the last decade has been the Conservative Party going back to 2006, I mean, really running a textbook campaign. I mean, we've seen uh, the, the Conservatives as being leaders, not just in Canada, but even in, in North America as far as voter identification goes. The uh, software that the Conservatives use in elections is the stuff of legends in a lot of ways. They, for a long time, really were we're pioneering this idea of, you know, identifying voters based on sort of a, a class of voter and, and going after these types of people. And, and now to have Tony Clement, one of the, the longest serving uh, sort of voices in, in this party and, and movement, saying, you know what, we need to up our game on the electoral machine. Did the Conservatives get kind of cocky with how good they were a decade ago and not really improve from there? Well, part of the problem with winning elections and being in power for 10 years is you, 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 you tend to get complacent. Uh, and sometimes that, yeah, sometimes you lose your edge. And the other guys are the ones out there trying new ideas. They're experimenting. They're looking at what other people are doing. And these, you know, these kinds of secrets to, to winning elections, these kind of tactical secrets or these nuts and bolts techniques, uh, you know, they're quickly used by other parties. You know, imitation breeds success. And so whatever advantage you have in those things is usually fleeting. And, and then, the, then they're working on the next What's the next thing that's going to help us win an election? So, yeah, sometimes if you're in power, you can, you can get, fall behind in that race. Um, but, you know, those things are easy to fix. You know, you hire some kid to, some, to, to run your social media. You, 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 you get better training for your people. That's all easy stuff. Uh, the hard part for the conservatives, as I said, is, is, you know, defining who they are and, and coming up with an ideology. They didn't need an ideology necessarily when they were in government. I mean, in fact, I think they, they shorn away all their ideological ideas and became more of a, of a, of a political marketing machine. And you can get away with that um, if you're the government because you're setting the agenda. But when you're in opposition, it's a different story because now you're reacting to another agenda, in this case, the liberal agenda. If you're going to react to that agenda in some kind of consistent way, you've got to have a blueprint. You've got to have a moral compass. And that's why they have to come up with who they are. And what does it mean to be a conservative? So I guess this brings us back to this realm of, is there still a place for the conservatives to be that big tent party, the party that has the social conservatives, the libertarians, the populists, and all these different groups? Or do they have to really put a, a stake in the ground and say, this is who we are now, take it or leave it? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm of, the, of, of the later option, and I think it's possible to come up with, a, with, a, with an ideological conservative party that also has a lot of support from across the board. It just depends on which issues you push. I mean, if you look at the successful conservative prime ministers or, and presidents in the past, take a guy like Ronald Reagan, he was successful because he united conservatives uh, under his anti-communism banner. You know, he was, a, he was the arch anti-communist, and that appealed to conservatives across the board. And as was Thatcher, a woman you mentioned earlier. Thatcher's the same way, except she, she was more like the, I'm taking on the big union bosses. And that unified conservatives across the board, similar to Mike Harris in Ontario. He was the kind of guy I'm going to take on the big union bosses, and that united conservatives. So it's just a matter of, and I'm not sure what this is, but the conservatives have to figure out what is that issue? What is that kind of lightning rod issue that will bring all conservatives together under a banner? And also, and this is also a key part, also will resonate with people who are not conservatives, or at least enough of people who are not conservatives to help us win the next election. Certainly be interesting to watch. Uh, we have a, a number of people that are potentially going to take over the leadership of the party. I guess the last thing I'd ask you, Jerry, I mean, do you think that the party has to wait until it has a new leader to really form that identity? Or is that something that needs to happen now with the interim leader to then determine who should become the next leader? Well, of course, the, 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 the next leader, the next elected leader is going to be, have a, a huge say in the direction of the party and the ideology of the party. In the meantime, however, I think, I think the conservative movement, you know, those people who are not part of the uh, uh, conservative party necessarily, 
but are just activists and, 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 and people who believe in conservatism, I think they should be getting out there and helping to define conservatism and pushing the conservative party in the right direction because conservative movement has been kind of complacent for the last 10 years. I think it's time to wake up and get into the fight. Yeah, I very much agree. Jerry Nichols joining me on the line, consultant and former vice president of the National Citizens Coalition. Uh, always a pleasure, Jerry. Really appreciate your time today, and Merry Christmas. Oh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you too, Yeah, Andrew. thanks very much, Jerry. I think there's a lot to be said about the packaging, for sure. You know, I know Jerry and I joked about it a little bit, but yeah, the average Canadian isn't like us. The average Canadian isn't one of these people who just thinks about policy alone and likes to crunch the numbers and do that sort of stuff. And I don't fancy myself as unique in that setting. I think I'm just a bit of a dork and a a bit of a geek and a nerd, and those three words may be interchangeable, but I couldn't think of any other adjectives. So where do we see the successes coming in politics, though? It's by holding on to the base and finding that winning coalition, finding the people who can win or you can win the support of and also getting your base out to vote. And I think most people would be quite disappointed to learn that elections are won or lost, not based on the best ideas, but based on the best messaging and based on the best strategy. That's why if you ever tell a party that you are going to vote for them, you're going to get like 10 calls leading up to the election day, making sure that you're actually going out to vote. Because it's easier to get you out as a supporter to vote than it is to find a new voter, convince them, and then get them out to vote. Identified voters, as they're known, are pretty much like gold in elections. But the reason I think it's important to focus on that is because what we had in the conservative campaign last time around, I think, was a flaw in policy as well as a flaw in messaging. And I should clarify, they did a good job at getting out the word of what the actual policies were, but the policies didn't fit in with the messaging that was needed, which was you can't trust Justin Trudeau to deal with your money. You can't trust Justin Trudeau with your paycheck. And as much as people may, who are listening to this podcast, be all for the kneecap ban in certain settings, be all for the revocation of citizenship of terrorists, etc., and I have qualms with both of those issues, by the way, and I've talked about them on the show before, most people should be able to agree that those were not winning issues with the undecided electorate. It was backfiring. The Conservatives kept doubling down, then tripling down, then quadrupling down. And by the time they realized it in that final week of the campaign, that was when they started talking about the payroll tax. That was when the Prime Minister started campaigning with the then Prime Minister, rather, with a cash register and these stunts and using props. And by that point, it was too late. Canadians had already made up their minds. So this is not meant to rehash old fights. It's meant to have a level of awareness as to how we can bring conservatism, again, going back to that small c or even better, libertarianism, into the fray in the next election. And by the way, I don't identify as a libertarian in a lot of different settings. I I did with Jerry because I know that he and I are of the same mind. When I hear libertarian, I still think of the people that think legalizing marijuana is the number one issue, the Ron Paul supporters that chant end the Fed. No, no, no. I'm a moderate libertarian. Not that I've ever been known for my moderacy in anything, including body weight, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We've got to take a quick break here, but we'll have more of Lawton Online and a final wrap-up of the show when we come back in just a couple of moments, folks. This is the Rebel.media. Stay tuned. He's a reverent, intelligent, and indefatigable. You're tuned in to Lawton Online with Andrew Lawton. Welcome back to Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. We are going to change things up a little bit here. It's a special show, the last show before Christmas. And this is obviously, for me anyway, an important day. I talked a little bit about it at the top of the show. I love this time of year. But I was struck by a realization earlier this week, and it's something that hits me every year. And it's not a debilitating thing, by the way. But it's a thought that comes into my mind and is something that I tend to dwell and and reflect on for a little while. And I actually posted something about this on Twitter. You know, people don't realize in Canada how many countries around the world our soldiers are stationed in. From peacekeeping to support to training 
airstrikes. I mean, we have Canadian soldiers in dozens of locations. Some of them are very small numbers. From a contingent of, I think, five people in Haiti to dozens in northern Iraq and Syria. We have people in Kosovo. We have soldiers in the Ukraine. We have soldiers in Cyprus. We have soldiers in the Sinai Peninsula and Egypt. We have soldiers in areas governed by the Palestinian Authority. We have Canadian soldiers in so many different places. Most of them are in relatively benign roles in terms of the ability of one of these areas being a dangerous one. But still, they're there and they're serving their country. And these deployments are in pursuit of peace, in pursuit of freedom, in pursuit of global and international cooperation. And they happen on the back burner without fanfare, without public attention, without public knowledge in some cases, not because it's a secret, just because it's not as glamorous as some of the, and I don't even like the word glamorous, but not as potent as some of the more politically charged deployments. And these people, for the most part, will not get the chance to see their families face to face this Christmas. They signed up for it. They knew the job. They know what a soldier's life is. I have friends who are active duty soldiers who are deployed right now, friends who are back in Canada with their families. Some get to see them, but as I said, most don't. So I don't want to depress anyone because I know that soldiers that I've met in Canada and in the U.S. want us to celebrate. They want us to be happy. They want us to enjoy the freedom that we have. But I still wanted to give an a, special, a special note of thanks, and I know several uh, members of the Canadian Armed Forces listen to this podcast. I've heard from them. For all of you, thank you very much for your service. And more importantly, Merry Christmas. Folks, that concludes this show. I'll be back with one more show before the new year. But thank you, God bless, and Merry Christmas Canada. This is Lawton Online. I'm Andrew Luck. Thanks for tuning in to Lawton Online. Check out the rebel.media for lots more fearless content and commentary.